All right, James Paxton, the Big Maple. Welcome, champion. Now, first Thank of all, it, it, the, the, the Big Maple, is that, is that a thing in New York like it was in Seattle? Uh, yeah, they, they run with it. It's uh, still, <laughs> still the nickname. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's, is there a Maple Grove in the outfield or anything like that or no? No, I don't have that. All I've got out there is uh, the judges, judges' chambers at this point. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yep. What, the ju- what, what, okay. So, the, so there's no. I mean, was, was is the Yankees PR? Are they as hands on as the Mariners were? Uh, it's different. You know, they the Yankees they do a lot of stuff. I mean, there's a lot of media, obviously, and they're you know managing that. And there's all kinds of requests and things going on. Um, but as far as kind of like the say the king's court or you know maple grove stuff like that there's there's not quite there's not as much stuff like that going on it's definitely different obviously i've, I've pitched in new york and it's amazing when, when you have to you know generate the 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 you know the pr things and, and the publicity and and the promotions now i feel mm-hmm. like the yankees they just roll it out and say hey look here you go here it is Maybe here it is. The, yeah here's your yeah. head and, and it takes care of itself so exactly. is, speaking of that is is there Obviously, you know, you've had a year now with the Yankees, big market team, and I want to talk about that in a second as far as, you know, where you grew up, you know, in, in a small small part of the world. It's not like you grew up in a big city, so that must be a transition. Mm. But when you look at the two, you spent the first half, majority, most of your career in Seattle, off to New York, right? Is there anything you're missing? And I have to ask this, man, because people, people are hounding me, hey, what does he miss about Seattle? Is there anything you, you, you're missing about being with the Mariners organization or Seattle or the, the city or anything like that? You know, Seattle's a great city. I love Seattle. Um, my family's close by, you know, up in Vancouver. I've got friends in Seattle, which was great. Um, built a lot of relationships there, being there for so long. Uh, my wife and I love the area. Um, and the people there are fantastic. You know, it, it's just a, it's a great Great city. Um, I have nothing but fond memories of Seattle, um, and I and I, I do miss uh, being in Seattle. It's it's a great great place, you know. Um, great city. That being said, the experience in New York uh, last season was awesome. Also, like you said, I, I haven't been a big city kid. Um, I never grew up in the big city, so having the opportunity to to live in the big city and experience the bright lights and go through all of that was really rewarding. Um, Love the team there. The team is great. The coaches are great. All the staff is awesome. Um, really enjoyed uh, my experience in New York. And, you know, I'll look forward to going back this year at some point whenever we get going again. When you were a kid, you know, growing up in, in uh, Ladner, B.C., right? I said that right. I'm not messing you, that yeah, up. Yeah, you, you nailed it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> nice. Were you that kid that said, hey, one day I'm going to pitch for the New York Yankees? Or were you like, man, there is no chance. There is no chance that's ever going to happen. You know, I don't remember this, but my grandma told me um, that when I was younger, she had asked me like who I was going to play for when I was older. And she, I don't remember this, but she said that I said, I said that I was going to play for the Yankees. Um, And I don't don't remember that, but um, she said she was very adamant that I said it was going to be the Yankees. Um, And turns out, look, look where I am. I'm pitching for the Yankees. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, hey, and and obviously we're all you know shut down at the moment. I'm noticing the facial hair, dude. Yeah. What, look, and and by the way, I I'll be honest with you, I actually kept this. Right? Mm-hmm. I, I I kept the facial hair in honor of you. I haven't shaved, man. Usually, like before I do this, the only opportunity I get, I haven't worn jeans in like two months, right? And that's <laughs> probably colder where you're at. But usually yeah. I shave. I'm like, hey, you know what? I'm not going to shave because this dude. And, and you've made a pretty big deal about it. You had the stash last year, which I love, by the way. And then you got rid of it. But one of the big, the big things, you know, joining the Yankees, got to shave that facial hair. What, but so right, so right now, if, you, if you're doing any kind of, you know, getting on Zoom or, or doing any kind of get, jumping on Yes Network or anything like that, I mean, do you have to be clean shaven or they're, they're cool with it in the off season? Uh, you know, Yes Network would be a good question. I'm not sure um, if I had to do something like official for the Yankees, if I'd have to change, if I'd have to shave. Um, we did a zoom meeting with the team, like just like all the players and staff and stuff and everyone had beards, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. Um, they, they didn't care. So I think, I think it's only maybe if I was going to do something for official for the Yankees right. or if they were going to use the footage later in the season or something like that, yeah. show it on the big screen, then I'd probably have to shave. <laughs> now I, I got to ask you this, man, what would happen? It, let's say, 
I'm, I'm not a dude on I'm not on a Garrett Cole contract. Let's say I'm, I'm a <laughs> <Who> couple. <am> I? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Well, then you, you could probably you, maybe you feel about this. What happens? I'm a couple years in, right? I'm a dude. I'm probably going to make the team that year, for example. And I rock up just looking like this. Yeah. What, what happens? Uh, honestly, probably not much. You'd probably just catch some some guff from the guys that say, "Hey, you know, you got shave or something like that." Someone would say something, but. It's not um, something that's like super focused on. You know, I, I got to the point last year, early on, I was shaving like every day. I was like super baby face every day, right? Because I was like, oh, I'm going to do this right, make sure I don't get any trouble kind of thing. But guys kind of let it go. They get a little bit of stubble going and then they shave. You know, you're not going to let it get to like this level. Um, but they, they, it's not as hardcore, I think, as it used to be. Right. Yeah. Who, who, who on that roster is saying, hey, dude, clean it up? It's kind of just anybody. They're just you kind know, of giving you giving you some trouble, just saying like, "Hey, you got you should probably shave." But they yeah. they do it in a fun way, you know, kind of messing with you. Um, I never had a coach or anybody say anything to me um, or any of the staff. No one ever said anything because no one pushed it far yeah. enough to you know have have to have someone say that to them. Yeah, what happens if you Garrett Cole rolling in with straight huge <laughs> beard, like he's just gotten out of that the off off a hunt or something like that? What, what happens then? I don't know. I don't know if anybody would say anything to him or, you know, I'm guessing that someone from the front office would probably, you know, say, Hey, you know, we need you to shave, yeah. please kind of thing. <laughs> whatever. But I don't know. And there's going to be a fine system or something, right? I, I, yeah, and here's the thing. Probably. I mean, you've probably answered this a million times. I've just, you know, I was, I was always wondering, it's like, okay, if I haven't got trade to the, you know, I'm not a big, I can't pull facial hair, hair off dude. This is as far as it goes. I, I just, I just hey, look it's a good dick. look. Yeah, it's a good look. Uh, you know, I'm I'm, I'm yeah. trying. Yeah, plus we're quarantined. You know, I'm stuck in the house. And yeah. the only, by the way, the only corner of the house I have, I've got two kids running the place. But uh, it, it's one of these things. I always thought, what if I just rolled in? I'm a couple years in the big leagues. I, I feel mm-hmm. like I'm an established dude, and yeah, you know, someone's going to pick out. There's no Derek Jeter there anymore to to you know who, who's right. a special assistant to the GM come down and say, hey, dude, get rid of it. I'm sure, but I, I I just always want to know, especially Garrett Cole rolls in. Yeah, that's a good question. I I don't know how they would handle that if Garrett just like came in with a big beard and would they say something? I don't I don't know who it would be. I'm sure something would get said, but I don't know by who or like how how they would enforce that. It's I don't I don't think it's in our contracts. You know, I think it's just one of those kind of unwritten things about the Yankees is you just shave your beard. I don't know. Yeah, and and that's again something you've obviously experienced this year, but that's the the fascinating thing to me, it's a respect thing, right? You, right it doesn't yeah. matter who you are. Yeah, you know, big market team, obviously the New York Yankees, you're not rolling in with any kind of stubble for day one in spring training. And that, right. that's, what, that's what I – and, again, nothing against the Mariners. Obviously, I work for them. But mm-hmm. that's the one thing. There's no one saying, oh, hey, screw this. I'm not doing that because it's just so ingrained yeah. into the culture there, which is did, – did you, did you feel that when, when you went over there? With not Obviously not with the shaving, but – there is a certain type of culture that you hadn't experienced before. It, yeah, it was a feeling of just kind of that history, you know, like yeah. New York is all about the history and the, the history of, of winning and the championships that are there. And, you know, they've got all the, the world series titles and stuff put up and there's, got, they've got so many legendary players that played for them. And it's yeah. just kind of, you feel like you're a part of something like uh, historic and it's, it's it's cool to be a part of, and uh, yeah. you know, just to be on that team is is special. Did you feel like a different pressure from day one, or or different expectations all of a sudden? Yeah, I think that I put on myself. You know, yeah. I I went over there and tried to be better, and I struggled the first half of the season. You know, I was adjusting, and it was a uh, it was hard. You know, I I tried to be better than I was. I have I was focusing on things that kind of took that distracted me from what I was trying to do on the mound. Um, and it took me some time to adjust and get used to being a Yankee, living in New York, having all that attention, just more attention on you with the media and, and stuff like that. Um, and it, it did take a little while, but you know, once I got used to it, I learned to just really enjoy it. So that's, that's a real thing. The distra- you talked about the stuff away from the mound, things that could be a distraction. Like, like give us an example. Is it just this, the, you know, the, whether it's, pressure you put on yourself or is there other things that that popped up in the beginning in the early stages i think uh you know for me just living in the city uh i had never lived in a city like that before i was living in uh in tribeca and uh 
walking up my front door and having so many people outside and it being loud and taking a subway to the stadium every day. Right. It was uh, just a totally different lifestyle, different experience. And it was a lot of input, you know, and just getting yeah. used to all that noise and everything, all that, uh, all that going on took, took some time to um, just walk outside and not have yeah. it affect me. You know, I think after a few months, I just walked outside. You don't even really hear all the, taxis and horns and honks and people yelling you don't even notice it after a little while right yeah but i mean so you're catching the train to the stadium right now if there's any yankees fans out there listening mm-hmm. I, I need to get my mouth shut here so you're catching the train to the stadium you've got that huge maple leaf tattooed on your arm right yep. you're not a small dude people obviously recognize you right uh at times you know i think when i was in lower manhattan people didn't really care that much right. um <laughs> as you get closer and closer to yankee stadium uh people I think started to notice more because there's more Yankee fans up there, more people like going to the game or going to batting practice and they know who the players are, you know, so that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. I'll tell you a story. I, I had a buddy in town. We're playing the Yankees and obviously no one knows who I am, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, um, you know, scrub on in the Mariners bullpen, but he had his, <laughs> he had his Mariners hat on, right? So straight yeah. after the game, we're like, Oh, we'll just catch the train home. And he says to me, he's like, oh, well, aren't you worried about, you know, Yankees? I'm like, dude, no one, you kid, no one's going to recognize who I am. We get on, but he's got this stupid Mariners hat on. I'm like, dude, get that hat off, man, because people, you know, people have had a few drinks or whatever. And again, they're not recognizing me, but here they yeah. are sitting there giving him all kinds of shit about wearing this, this hat. Yeah. And it was just like, oh, man, it was, the, I'm just kind of sitting in the corner like this. I'm like, if there's anything on me that gives away that I'm a player or something, I'm done. You know yeah, I mean? yeah, because Yankees right. fans are passionate. <laughs> yeah, big time. <laughs> so a little bit different to rolling out from Kirkland to to T-Mobile. So even those little things, they mm-hmm. they really affected you early on. Yeah, early on it was a lot to take in, a lot to get used to. Just a different pace of life, different style. Yeah. You know, East Coast. Um, it was my first time like living on the East Coast, really. Right. Um, you know, so that was all an adjustment. Do you, do you like living in the city? Uh, yeah, you know, it was a good experience. I really enjoyed it. Um, I got used to it once I, once I got used to it, I I found that I enjoyed it more. Um, you know, and when else are you going to get a chance to say I lived in New York city, you know, and actually like kind of live in the local life there was, it was cool to, to, to experience. Yeah. Hey, I mean, you're all in too. A lot of guys, you know, sort of stay on the outskirts and, and drive into that, but dude, you're, you're all in Tribeca. You mm-hmm. and, and it was you and it was Katie there the whole time. She was, yep. She okay. was with me the whole time. So she was there experiencing it. And we, you know, we'd walk to uh, the West side highway to walk yeah. our dog or the dog park over there. We had our favorite restaurants near the house and everything. Obviously there's so many restaurants to go yeah. to. Um, it was, uh, it was cool. Now speaking of, speaking of Katie, you, uh, you're in Wisconsin right now on lockdown, like we all are. Yeah. Right? Yep. That's why you've got the facial hair. That's the only reason why you get to have that. What, what kind of setup have we got? in quarantine right now do you have the i'm a starting pitcher for the yankees type house where you've got the yeah the underground batting cage basketball court and weight room where i mean what are we working with in where you're at right now in wisconsin uh no you know it's it's a pretty uh normal setup here normal normal house luckily i have a buddy here who has a private facility like workout facility baseball facility that i get to go into and work out i have some equipment there and i throw with him um, so I'm being able to stay ready that way, but my house, I don't have any of that kind of stuff in my house. <laughs> yeah. I was listening to I think a politician or, or some, you know, some news anchor talking about, um, athletes like, you know, this is early days of shutdown saying, well, you know, with, with sport being shut down and then they're like, oh, well, professional athletes are fine. They're all got basketball courts in their, in their house and batting cage. I'm sitting there thinking, uh, no, I missed the boat on this. Like, you yeah, can, yeah well, like maybe like the free agent, like big money guys. Yeah, yeah. sure. But like the other six hundred and you know, or yeah. how many baseball players are there in the league? There's like what thirteen hundred? Is that right? Something like yeah. I don't yeah. Ask, mate. Like, Put me on the maybe, spot. Here. Yeah, maybe the top hundred yeah. have that. But yeah. like, that's it. I'm sitting there thinking, hold on a sec, like completely out of touch. If that's yeah. and I'm like. Oh, is that how it is these days? Like, has it been that yeah. long? Because definitely didn't have that much, you know, two bedroom apartment, you know, trying to yeah. get close to town as I can. But, uh, exactly. okay. So, and, and you're in Eau Claire, you were living, you, you were spending the off seasons in Kirkland, right? Uh, we did for a while there. We bought this house uh, a few years ago. Um, we've been spending the off seasons um, here since then. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, it's a big change. So, so basically, you, 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 once the season starts, you're just getting like what, like a corporate lease or something in New York. It's not like you're, 
you know, you're setting up shop there. You don't spend any time there in the off season, right? No, no. We we did have to rent our place year round uh, for the place we right. found, um, but it, we didn't spend any time there in the off season. No. Yeah, right. And that that rent's a little bit more expensive than uh, most yeah. places, I'm sure. Yeah, no kidding. It was a bit of a bit of a shock heading over there, seeing the prices on some of the rentals. It was crazy. Hey, I, so, so as soon as you get you get traded to the Yankees, obviously you know you get in touch with them. Do you have you know once spring training starts? Is a situation you're a guy who's coming off some really good years and you made a huge adjustment with something I've talked to you a bunch of times about in your Mariner days about, about your arm slot, your arm angle. Mm-hmm. And I want to talk about that in a second. When you get to the Yankees, do they have a coach or an analytics department or someone say, hey, James, come over here, man. This is what you've been doing the last couple of years. Um, let's change this. Or is it a situation where you walk in, they say, hey, man, whatever you need, you just go for it and, and we'll figure it out? Uh, it was a little bit of a mix. They uh, did have some stuff for me when I got there as far as like pitch usage and stuff like that. They wanted me to use my cutter more. Um, so I did that quite a bit. But then I started using my curveball more uh, towards the end of the season because I really needed that shape. Um, yeah. But, you know, they, they had a really great analytics department, really great coaches um, that helped me a lot. Um, and I, I enjoyed working with all of them. They, uh, they were a great group. And, and, you know, with that too, so walking in, was it, was, was there any light bulbs that went off and said, oh man, I didn't even realize that, you know, the way the ball behaves or something like that, that, that you didn't have with the Mariners all of a sudden you caught on and said, man, that makes a lot of sense and take that into 2019. Uh, not really, you know, nothing yeah. glaring like that. Yeah. Um, it was more just a continuation of things that I'd been working on, like the high fastball, you know, right. the high fastball is big for me, um, especially the way it plays off of my curveball, and just the way that I throw my fastball hitting that, you know, high and inside spot is very uh, big for me in the way I pitch. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Cause uh, you know, I always wonder that, man, and I've spoke to a couple of guys who switch teams and a couple of them, they get to this new team and say, Hey dude, look, you've been doing this, especially with analytics, right? It's such a big mm-hmm. part of the game. A lot different yeah. than what it was, you know, 10 years ago, obviously. But they get to that new team and say, dude, you've been doing this and it sucks. This is why you're getting hit. And they're like, oh, this is great. And then they boom, they, they just take off because they, they just trust it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Was there anything on the reverse side of that? Was there anything that when you went in there and they said, hey, we want you to do this, that you're like, Ugh. you know, intuitively, I don't feel comfortable doing this. That may have, you know, um, been, had anything to do with that slow start. The big thing for me, I think, was uh, how they didn't, how they wanted me to use my cutter more and not my curveball, because I didn't right. throw my curveball very much in the first half of the season, um, because they were so big on my cutter slider. Uh, they really liked that pitch. It's great. It grades out really well um, yeah. through analytics and stuff like that. But I think that not using my curveball, having that slower pitch, because I don't really, I don't have a changeup. I needed that slower pitch to slow guys down with the cutter and the, with the cutter and the fastball. It's just hard, 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 you know, so guys were just sitting on hard pitches. I need some, I needed something slow to slow them down to ha- work that yeah. back and forth game a little bit more. So once I started mixing that curveball in more, they, it really did help me a lot. Did you ever have, speaking of the change up, did you ever have a pitching coach, you know, whether it's old school, it's like, Oh, you have to change speeds. You have to develop that change up. And he's just like, man, this just, this is getting crushed. I've been trying for eight years. You know, I've, it's, been, it's, it's been in development mode for the last eight years. I've been working on it in, uh, in quarantine here now, um, and it's feeling pretty good. You know, I, I might be a pitch that I get to throw five or six times a game now. I'm just yeah. not sure. But, uh, you know, it's, I'm throwing it off the mound now in bullpens and everything, and it's, uh, it's feeling the best that it's felt, you know, just because I have that time yeah, to yeah. really, like, kind of hone in on it. Yeah, right. And speaking of the quarantine, is this something – are you in constant communication? The uh, you know the the organization reaching out to you saying, "Hey, this is the new plan." Do you have any kind of inside as to what ins- you know inside information as to when things are going to kick off again? I don't know anything more than anyone else. You know, yeah. I uh, I've seen the rumors like everyone else. Uh, I haven't heard anything solid from anyone. You know, there's nothing official that's come across to the players at this point. Um, it's just all speculation right now yeah right now talking about some of the the you know adjustments and everything else i want to talk about this this is my first game ever i did on tv was your first game june 1st 2016 okay. and I, I i want to say and correct me if i'm wrong here felix was supposed to make that start 
Maybe. That, was this I when I got called up from AAA? Because you got I yeah. Was the year. yeah. Yeah, 2016. You got called up from AAA. And I remember it was my first game, so I'm gung ho, right? And it was in San Diego, so I'm driving down. I lived in, in LA. So they said, okay, yeah, we'll give, we'll give you some time on TV. I was like, sweet, got in the car, drove to San Diego, and then halfway down, I got some text message. Hey, hey, um, you know, I, I never forget, I got a text message saying, Paxton's going to pitch for Felix because I had all this, I sat there all night. Like, literally, I was going to be on TV for like 10 minutes. And I'm sitting there just doing pages of that Felix. Like, I'm just going to blow it away. And um, and they got a text message saying, oh, you know, Paxton's just been called up. Um, mm-hmm. You were called up. It wasn't, you weren't coming off the, D, off the DL at that point or anything like that. And I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. I swear to God, dude, like five minutes later, my tire blows out. So there I am in full suit because <laughs> I'm going on TV. Sweat. It was hot too, man. It, driving, down that, driving down that freeway, trying to change his tire. I'm, I'm freaking out, panic mode. I'm like, yeah. oh, man, this is never going to work out. And then I remember I'm sitting there waiting for my car to be towed, right, because mm-hmm. I had a car, had a car that the, the, um, it, needed a compl- it didn't have a, a spare tire in the trunk. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Anyway, so I'm starting to, to, to look into it. And it said, oh, one of the, the reports is, oh, James Paxton's changed his, his arm slot. He's been mm-hmm. working on this. And I'm sitting there going, okay, and no offense, and I'll admit this. I'm like, this is one of those last resorts where you had that super high arm slot. Yep. We're going to try and put it down here. I'm like, it never really bodes well for a dude who, who sort of used that deception. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. And so, so – yeah, I'm sitting there thinking, oh, God, here we go. Okay, what am I going to say here? Because I'm going to be captain positive, dude. Right? Like, I can't be like, oh, yeah, this is going to be terrible. <laughs> and then forget, dude. Like, and, and, you, and you, you, I mean, you gave it up that game. Yes, right? I, that was brutal. That was a tough game. That <laughs> yeah. did not go well. Right. So, <laughs> so you see, so you, you get, but I remember, I never forget the first couple pitches, man. Your arm slot looked completely different. Mm-hmm. Like, you were way, it, it wasn't this, like, you know, millimeter of a difference. And I'm just watching 97, 98. And I'm like, hold on a second. Where's this velo coming from? Mm-hmm. With with that, I wanted, to, and, I, and again, this is something that fascinated me because your career basically just did this yeah. after you after you made that adjustment. Where did all that start from? Was it a, a coach you had in the in the minor leagues, or someone said, "Hey, why don't we try this?" Because even at that point, it wasn't like it wasn't a big analytical thing. Was it more of just like a, a naked eye? This is what I'm seeing. Try this. Where did all that come from? Well, so it starts out in spring training that year. Um, I really struggled. Like I'd always throw, I had, I had always thrown like decently hard, you know, but I came into spring training that year and I was throwing slower than I ever had. And I was having a hard time locating for some reason. Well, like, like how, how, what, what velo are we talking? I was throwing like 90, 91, gotcha. you know, and I'm usually like a, I don't know. I was probably like a 93, 96 guy before that. Um, and I wasn't locating well. Things weren't going well in spring training. They sent me down, and I was in AAA. And my, I had a pitching coach in AAA who was my pitching coach in AA, Lance Painter. And right, he, Lance. I know Lance. Yeah, he was telling me that he thought that my arm angle had crept up over the years and thought it was higher than it was when I was with him in AA. So we watched some video and stuff, and he was like, hey, I just, wanna, I just want you to, like, play long toss you know with your arm angle being a little lower um because i i had thrown probably two or three maybe four games in triple a with the higher arm slot and things just weren't going well i was getting crushed in triple a it wasn't it was bad so, so okay so this is the season's already kicked off this yeah, wasn't the end of spring off. training okay. no this was yeah, so, so if, if you go back a couple of weeks at the end of spring training mm-hmm. they call you in the office right because i was there in spring training i remember actually i remember when you walked out of the office you got sent down yeah. What what was the the vibe like? Because when, when you think about it, dude, you were basically it was and no offense, but it was kind of like okay, where's this career going in a yeah. sense, right? And you talked about you know your velos down, so all of a sudden, you know, from a, a front office standpoint, they're probably looking at this going, oh, there could be some underlying injury or something like that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, after that, I mean, you, was it a situation where like okay, I'm going to try this because you got to be all in. It's not something like oh, I'll just try that, and take it into a game, right? Yeah, well, I felt I was terrible. You know, like it was it was bad the way I was throwing. I was I couldn't locate. I mean, my first game in AAA, I think I walked like five or six guys in that game. I couldn't throw anything for a strike, and I wasn't throwing hard. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, what the heck's going on? I felt like I had completely lost it. You know, right. so three or four games in, you know how it goes. You have three or four bad games in a row, and you're just like beside yourself, like, oh, what's going on? Like, what's happening? You know, you can have one or one or two bad ones, and then you bounce back, yeah. but to have four in a row where you're just like, Oh, I can't, I can't do anything right. 
So they had me, you know, play catch. Um, but actually, they had me take some ground balls to the mm-hmm. backhand side and then throw without thinking about it, right? And my arm slot was lower than it was when I play catch. And they're like, okay, that's how you find your natural arm slots. You take some ground balls yeah. to the backhand side and then you just throw it over first. And my arm slot was lower. They're like, okay, your arm slot's lower. We think that's your natural arm slot. We want you to try and play some long toss with this lower arm slot. Mm-hmm. Now, it felt like I was throwing like straight sidearm. Yeah. You know, because you know when you make a small adjustment like yeah. that, you, oh, yeah. you feel like you're like down here, but you're really right here. Yeah. So it felt like I was just ripping at sidearm, but um, the ball was just jumping out of my hand in uh, this long toss session. So I'm like, all right, might as well try it. So I went out my next game. So the game before, I was probably throwing 90-91. I came back the next game throwing that lower arm slot, and I jumped up to 95-96, like, wow. just like, instantly. And everyone was like, dude, like, it's not that easy. What, like, how, <laughs> like, what, what's going on? Dude, if I, if I was your teammate, I would be so pissed. I'd be like, <laughs> screw this, dude, because, because you're a guy that, yeah, and, and it's a salty squad in AAA, right? So, like, yeah. you, if I was, yeah, let's say I was a little bit older or whatever, or whatever, it, doesn't, it wouldn't matter. And you're yeah. up here and you're starting to, to struggle or whatever. And like, okay, yeah, this, all right. You know, where's this career going? All of right. a sudden you just, you go like this and zap, mid yeah. mid drop and 90s. I'll be like, are you kidding? Yeah, like, exactly. No, like it's just that easy. Yeah, sorry. So yeah. Keep, keep, keep going. Exactly. So then, you know, I started doing this lower arm slot. I was throwing really hard, but I had lost my breaking ball, my curve ball, right. because, you know, it's a different arm slot, yeah. different angles and stuff. So that's when actually when I started throwing the, was it before that? I don't know. I started throwing the cutter more right. um, because from, arm, from that arm slot, it was easier to throw the cutter slider. Mm-hmm. So it took me a while to get my curveball back. Um, I think it, even when I came back to uh, the big leagues, I think that was part of my problem yeah. was that everything was hard. You know, I had nothing gotcha. slow to slow guys down with. So it took me some time to find that curveball again and have something slow to slow guys down with. Um, you know, with that being said, I obviously knew that that lower arm slot was where I needed to be. Uh, because the velo came back, I was locating better, all that stuff. So, so, it so was, command wasn't an issue. It was better, you think, with that lower slot? Yeah, command was command was way better. You know, I was able to locate the ball much better. It was just a matter of mixing speeds um, for me once I got back. And um, dude, when we get off this, mate, straight to the text message. Say, like, Lance is checking in. I want to say hi, mm-hmm. or at least send him a Christmas card. Whatever you do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> send yeah, him a Christmas card. Obviously, this is not your natural arm slot. When you come in to, you know, play a college level, high school level, who was the coach who said, hey, get, you know, get this really high arm slot going? You know what's funny? It wasn't anybody. Because in college, I was a lower arm slot guy too. And then I uh, had some time on my own, and I was just throwing, doing what was comfortable. And that's when I started throwing way, way over the top like that. Um, right. I don't really know what made me do it. It was just something that I did. And then, like I said, uh, Lance Painter, when I was in double A, said that it wasn't as high. Um, when I was in double A, it got higher and higher over the years. Um, and that's why we and, just need and to bring you, it back down. You, you weren't trying to, like, create deception or think, you know, I'll get on top of the ball or create downhill plane or any of those little, you know, buzzwords you hear? You know, I was, maybe I was, like, thinking, like, oh, I got to create more, got to create more. And then I got higher and higher and higher until I got to the point where I just couldn't create that power. It couldn't create that, uh, uh, like I couldn't locate as well. Yeah. Um, and I think I just did it without even knowing that I did it and not knowing that, um, yeah. it was hurting me. That was always the thing, man. Again, this is pre analytics and everything else, but it was always, like, Oh, you got to create an angle, get on top of the ball. And, and you know, this, that, and the other, I remember Doug Fister. I don't know if you remember him or not. Doug, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Played against him or, or maybe with him. I can't, I don't know. But, um, yeah, he always, he had that, he did have that visually, that, that mm-hmm. tilt. And i never forget, I'm sitting there and he's, he's throwing lights out, the early days with the Mariners. Yeah. And I, had, I can't remember who was standing, he's like, oh, see the tilt? You need to get that tilt. It's like, dude, like there's no way I can just generate this. It'd, look, it'd be ridiculous. And that's yeah. why, you know, that's why I was wondering, like if it was a coach, you know, and, and not that it's an old school, I mean, obviously best intentions, but if it's a situation where like, hey, get tilt, you're a tall dude, you know, try and generate some tilt when you're in, you know, junior high or something like that. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to Lance though, man. I mean, he his name should be thrown around a lot more and given a lot more credit, not from yeah. you, but from from everyone. And I, I I had some runnings. He was never my pitching coach, but I always you know was always around Lance. Um, I mean, it's pretty amazing, dude. Because you think about what happened with that career. You know, yeah. it's I mean, it's it's it was, 
Yeah, it was huge. I mean, and he's, he's, he's always been so great to me, you know, and he, uh, he's never wanted, um, credit for anything like that, yeah. but he, he helped me so much and really took time with me and, um, talked to me about it, showed me video and really, you know, without him, I wouldn't have made it back to, yeah. to the big leagues if I hadn't made that, that change and had him helping me through it. You know, it was interesting. I, you know, I got shelled that first start back and <laughs> I'm in the, I'm in the outfield the next day, uh, shagging VP and service walks around. He comes up to me in the outfield. He's like, Pax, we're going to give you one more shot. And he's like, really? Yeah. He says, you're going to, you have one more chance. And he says, you're either going to go out there and do really well and, or do better. And yeah. you're going to stick around or you're going to go out there and struggle again. And you're going to go down to triple A and stay there for a while. He's like, you're at a crossroads in your career right wow. now. You're either going to go out there and do okay, stay, do bad, go down to triple A, stay there. So pressure's on, you know, I go home and we're playing against Texas the next game. In, in Texas or in, in at home in, uh, uh, in Seattle. Gotcha. And I ended up pitching pretty well, you know, so I got to stick around and, like you said, my career just kind of took off from yeah. there. But, uh, yeah. do, you, do you feel like when he came out and said, you look, you got one more start, dude. Yeah, because that did, I would be like, I'd lose sleep in the next four days. Do <laughs> yeah. you respond well to that? Uh, yeah, I feel like I did. I feel like it was kind of the kick that I needed to, uh, to really take it to that next level. You know, right. he, also, he also talked to me a little bit about showing some emotion on the mound. Right. Um, and that's kind of when I started – you know, doing my glove tap thing after strikeouts and everything. And that was more about showing the rest of the team that I was into it. You know, I was always in it between, between the years, but it was more about just showing some energy and, uh, and that kind of thing. So that wasn't, you know, and, and showing the emotion, that wasn't something that you were trying to really force and manufacture. You had that in you, but it was something where, you know, you're just a little bit self-conscious before that you'd strike someone out. You just feel like you want to do the right thing, walk off the mound. So that, that's, that's in there and you just kind of like just let it go? Or is that something you kind of had to force a little bit because you got your manager basically saying, hey, look, show some emotion. Are you getting sent down? Pitch yeah. well. Are you getting sent down? Mm -hmm. Is that something you had to force a little bit? Yeah, it's something I had to think about, you know, because I'd never been like that. I'd yeah. always been more of a reserved guy. Like I was fired up in my mind, but I'd never yeah. really shown it. And I still, I'm still not a guy who really wears my emotions on my sleeve, but for the first little while, I definitely had to think about it. Sometimes I would forget, but as I did it more and more, now it's just kind of more natural, you know, yeah. it just kind of comes out now, but it did, it was kind of like a fake it till you make it kind of thing. Gotcha. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's speaking of that little term, you said fake it till you make it. Do you work with mental skills coaches? Like, oh yeah. Did, yeah. A lot. Do you, do you have, you, do you have your go-to guy, your own little guru that you work with? Yeah, there's someone with the uh, Boris Corporation that I talk to uh, mm -hmm. quite a bit. I talk to him a lot in the minor leagues and quite a bit during the season, usually like once between starts kind of thing. I talked to him a lot when I first got to New York um, and even like throughout my time in New York. Right. Um, his name's Don Carmen. Wow. He's, uh, he's great. And I, I talked to him for a long time. I think that the mental side of the game is huge, um, you know, because so much of this game is between the years and yeah. how you – how you approach it and how you're thinking about things, just the aggressiveness, all that stuff. And I feel like it's helped me a ton. So what point in your career did you start locking in with him? I, that was early, you know, I was yeah. in the minor leagues. I was probably in a ball when I started yeah. talking to him and it yeah. was, we've gone through, you know, multiple things, you know, there's yeah. so many things that you have to overcome on your way to uh, get into the big leagues, whether it's uh, comparing yourself to others and, mm -hmm you know, focusing on one pitch at a time, not worried about, you know, getting a bad call in your opinion from the umpire or an error happening behind you, you know, all kinds of stuff. Is the in his, you know, philosophies is comparing yourself to other people. Is that a healthy thing? Good thing? Bad thing? In the way that I look at it, it's, it's not, a, it's not a good thing, you know, cause if you're yeah. thinking about someone else, you're not thinking about what you have to do to uh to be better you know i think that if you focus on yourself and doing the best that you can do and doing your job that's going to mm -hmm. mean that you're the most locked in on what you're trying to accomplish not worried about what other people are doing what are some things if you could like you know pinpoint i'm putting you on the spot here but for him because mm -hmm. i love that i love the, the mental side of this and there's and i'm sure you've run into this too there's a ton of people get paid a lot of money or an organization will bring someone in and, and pay them a boatload to come and talk to a team. And you're just sitting there like six o'clock in the morning, spring training, yep. rolling your eyes. It's like, dude, 
if you've never pitched in the big leagues, don't tell me how it's supposed to go down, right? Like it's, yeah. it's, it's hard to, to gain that trust. With, yeah. with, it, it's, uh, you say his name, Don Carmen. Mm-hmm. What are some, some of the big things that you took away that, that you will never forget that etched in, in that head of yours that he gives you that really help you in, in, in a tough spot? Let's say you got like, you know, the playoffs last year for the first time or, or you know, when, you, when, you, when you're really struggling to figure this out. I think one of the biggest things that we've kind of attacked is just my pre-pitch plan, you know, and how you have to give everything you've got on every pitch. You can't take one pitch off. And for me, I, when I'm pitching, I I see the pitch in my mind that I want to throw before I throw it. And then I let it rip, you know, and it's for him also what he teaches is like, you've got your thinking brain and you've got your athletic brain, Mm -hmm. your thinking brain can't work fast enough to, to pitch. Your athletic brain is the brain that allows you to do what you do. So if you're too busy thinking too much about what you're trying to accomplish, you're, you're not going to be able to do it. You just have to, you have to see your body knows what to do. You have to see it, trust your body and then go full athletic mode and just let it, let it rip. Do you ever feel like you get to you know, situations where it's just your heart rates to the roof and you're, you're talking about visualizing that pitch, which is, by the way, it takes a lot of work. I, I feel like some people, whether you're an athlete or not, think they're going to pick up a book or run into someone and they're just going to give them you know, the, the, the magic pill and boom, they're good to go. But it, it takes a lot of work, right? To, right. To, 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 you know, especially when your arm slots up here and you're throwing 91 miles an hour and you don't know where your career is going, to sit down and talk to him because some of the stuff they, they – they say to you, sounds redundant. And you're like, man, I'm sick of you telling me this or I'm sick of hearing this. Give mm-hmm. me something that works. But when you talk about like that, that example, talk about visualizing that pitch, is that something you have to remind yourself constantly? Or is there situations where your heart rate's through the roof, crowd at Yankee Stadium, just, just giving up a three-run bomb and mm-hmm. you just flat out just pull the anchor up and you just keep throwing that ball and you're just so frustrated that you forget to do these little things that you've worked on with, with Don or, who, or on your own? Absolutely. It takes work. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't happen right away. Um, at the beginning, when you start doing these things, like when, I, when I first started doing that, I really had to think about it. And I would not do it sometimes, and I'd find yeah. myself getting in trouble. But he explains it like this. He's like, you get on these train tracks, right? You're on the train tracks and doing it the way you're supposed to do it. Mm-hmm. You're going to fall off. It's about being able to get back on. Right. And every time you get back on, the longer you stay on the train tracks for. Um, and it's like that with anything, like any yeah. kind of habit. Like you have to focus on it, do it, bring yourself back to it, bring yourself back to it. And the more times you do it, the more just you do it without even thinking about it. But it takes, it takes work, you know, yeah. and then it takes awareness. You have to be aware that you're off the track before you can get back on. And do you ever look into your body language? Like you know, having like, you know, being an alpha or, or, or study the way you look physically. Is that something he talk, he talks to you about? Uh, a little bit, not, uh, yeah, I'd say a little bit. Uh, we dealt with it at one point where, you know, if you are out there struggling, you don't want to be like out, like huffing and puffing, and pouting yeah. around. Cause that's when your opponent knows that you're beat. Right. You know, it's like, like we said, like the fake it till you make it, like you got to fake it that you, you're out there, you know, exactly what you're doing. You are doing things on purpose. Um, yeah. and not letting it show that you, that you're struggling, you know, right. and that's just all about that focus and determination to to find a way to get it done yeah and, and just going back to the um the huge adjustment you made and, and, and again this is going to because again i and i'll put my hand up and i'll admit and i'll i'll think i'm awesome for this after that you gave up a boatload of runs man i mean yeah you really like, gave it up i think it was like seven and three innings or something like that yeah shannon dreyer and i were speaking up just in like an empty booth. And I said, he's going to be nasty. You watch. I swear to God, and I, I can, not that you care, but I can, anyone who's listening, I can prove it. I was, because I was like, man, it just looked so fluent and so effortless. And the mm-hmm. ball, just the swing and miss all of a sudden went through the roof. Right. Yeah. I think too, and, and just going back to, back to, you know, you come up, you get, finally get called back up. You feel like you've got something that works. That's completely different though, doing it down at Tacoma than doing yeah. it in the big leagues because you get up there, all of a sudden, all the eyes are on you. Your arm slots change. So they're like, oh, look at his arm slot. And next thing you know, you have to put up some numbers right away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was uh, – pressure was on for that second yeah. game for sure, you know, right. knowing that, like, I, if I did bad, I was going back down AAA and staying for a while. It was, uh, it was tough, you know, and I did it, – it took a lot of uh, 
I just, I just really had to go out there and just give it everything. You know, I was like, look, if I'm, if I'm going to go down, I'm going to go down swinging. I'm going to go down going as hard as I can, uh, as hard as I can possibly go. And, does, uh, yeah. Does that arm ever creep back up from that point on? Did you ever have to say, hey, okay, all right, let's get that arm slot back in check? Yeah, it was, we definitely tracked it. You know, like there were times that it was a little bit higher, a little bit lower. We just kind of had to find that sweet spot. And I still yeah. do track it, you know, to see if I'm getting a little higher, a little low. Um, I think the biggest thing was making sure that it was the same on all pitches. You know, yeah. I didn't want to be creeping right. up on the curve ball or going lower on my cutter. So it was getting all of that. So everything was coming out of the exact same arm slot. How, how do you track it? Do you use technology or is it just straight video? Um, it was eyes, you know, by pitching yeah. coaches. And also now they have like the, I think it's, what is it? Pitch FX or something like that. Yeah, that gotcha. can, that can uh, track your release points and stuff like that. So they'll show me a little grid of like where my release points were. So I yep. can keep track of that. Right. Gotcha. And, and, and speaking of just sp speaking of technology real quick, is that something you're, are you into? I, I mean, are, are you in, do you want to see a report like the analytics side of things before you go into your game or are you just straight, not old school, but you just straight feel where I just want to feel like this, this is working, that's working. I'm just going to go for it. I think I'm more feel, you know, I've never really been huge into the analytics side of it. Um, we have a pitching coach in New York now, uh, Matt Blake, who is very, you know, versed in all of the uh, analytics stuff pitching wise. And I know that he's bringing some new ideas to the yeah. team. Um, and so I've started paying attention to uh, spin rate a little bit more, you know, while, while we're, you know, off right now, not playing. I've been working on trying different things to increase spin rate, um, the way that I hold the ball and also some finish things. And I, I'm seeing some results, which is cool. So, uh, so, so with the spin rate thing, I want to ask you this, is yeah. that something that you can, you can get a better spin rate? And you're talking about the way you, the, you, the way you grip, what are some of the things you do to try and get that, that more RPM on the ball? Well, one thing that I just noticed, this was like maybe last week, so it kind of happened without even thinking about it. I got this little like cut on my thumb just from like throwing the ball, you know, how you, you yeah. kind of create um, like calluses on your fingers from like yeah. throwing the ball. I got this little cut on one of my calluses on my thumb. So I usually hold the ball with my thumb kind of being on the ball like this. Right. So I took my thumb off the ball because I wanted, didn't want to like keep on pulling out that cut. And I noticed that when I took my thumb off the ball and just kind of had it resting here, I was taking away like a contact point on the yeah. ball, which was gotcha. kind of stopping the spin when it comes out of my hand. So by taking that thumb, and I have a hitchhiker's thumb. So I just kind of like uh, put <laughs> I've that. I've never heard that before, hitchhiker's thumb. So some guys put their thumb underneath the ball, and yeah. you, just, you just apparently get the most spin rate when your thumb is underneath the ball. But I, always, I could never throw the ball like that because I didn't know where I was going. I like to have a little bit of direction. So I thought if I could just, you know, rest it on this thumb to have, like, an idea of where it's going. Um, I tracked it with a ball that we have here. It's like a pitch logic ball or something like that that will tra track your RPMs. Yeah. And I took that thumb off, and we tracked it in a bullpen that I threw. And my RPMs went up by 250. Um, wow. RPMs, which is a lot um, yeah. in, in, an R, in the RPM world, like trying to up your RPMs. Um, I spent some time talking to Garrett Cole uh, in spring training because he's a big um, uh, spin rate guy. He gets great spin rate on his fastball. So he talked about some like grip strength stuff. So I've been working on grip strength mm -hmm. and uh, just way that, one way that like, he finishes, he kind of finishes with his arm like pulled back. I'd always yeah. been a guy that finished right here. Gotcha. So I've seen, some, I've seen a number of things uh, that I've been trying to do uh, over this time that's increased my spin rate quite a bit wow. and it's kind of fun to play with um and for those of you who list who are listening um pax just basically picked the ball up and threw it through the drywall um if you, <laughs> if you can't watch it make sure you go to youtube you can check that out um also <laughs> all right so and by the way i'm writing this stuff down i might have to make a make, make a comeback here that's the reason why i didn't play as long as i did is because the spin rate right so i have to you know <laughs> I'm thinking about coming back and, and uh, while we're quarantined. There you Eric go. Cole, is, is that a guy that you, know, you guys buy pretty good in spring training? Uh, yeah, I, I knew him uh, before he came over to the Yankees. We yeah. trained together when we were younger. He's a Boris client as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we had trained together when we were like 20, 21, something like that. And we stayed in touch. Um, yeah. And when he came over, I felt pretty comfortable with him. We were just talking, you know, hanging yeah. out. And uh, – we were, I was picking his brain about pitching and everything. And this, the spin rate thing was something that we had talked about in one of our meetings in camp. 
and I was picking his brain about it. And he, he, you know, he's a very smart guy has a lot of great ideas and obviously he knows what he's doing. He's made a lot of adjustments over his career and he was just sharing with me some of the things that he did um, over the past few years to increase his spin rate. So I thought I, you know, had the time I was dealing with my injury coming back from that. So I had the time to play with some things and, you know, it's helping out a little bit. He is so nasty, dude. Like, yeah, being in the AL West um, last year, just watching him every time. It, it was, honestly, it was a situation. Anytime I watched him, I'm like, okay, all right, can he break? Like, every time he went on the pitch, can he break the 20K mark? Like, no. it's, it's, it just looks so effortless and just zap up in the strike zone. No one's yeah, got a chance. Amazing. Yeah, his stuff is so nasty. It's just like, it, I know he's put a lot of hard work into what he does. Yeah. And, he, uh, you know, he, He's just, he's an amazing competitor and uh, has nasty stuff. Yeah. Now, I know you've talked about this, you know, to the cows come home. No hitter, right? Mm-hmm. I've had people want me to talk, want, want me to ask you about, about the no hitter. A couple, okay. de- couple, couple details, because I, I did the game. I remember I actually talked about this the other day on the radio. I was in a studio. You guys are obviously on the road in Toronto, and I was in the studio. I'm watching, I'm like, man, he's going to throw a no hitter. I mean, this is way later in the game. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was so cool. But when you're sitting in a studio, it's dead, dead quiet, dead silence, right? And I'm like, I'm so, I'm, I'm, I'm pr- pretty pumped up, right? Like, you know, you're a good dude. I got to know you pretty well. Matter of fact, you're probably the, the, the guy I knew the most on the team. Yeah. And I'm sitting there. I'm like, I'm excited, but it's so hard to manufacture the excitement when you're sitting in the studio. You know? oh, and yeah. And you're like, oh, hey, Ron, they're going to go back to you for your thoughts. I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to kill it here <laughs> because people are, people are watching. Now, going back to that for you, in that game, talk us through that. When you're warming up for that game, Right, and again, I know you've talked about this a ton, so I won't, I won't be a dead horse here. But when you're warming up for that game, is this because you talked about you didn't feel too great that game, right? No, I didn't. I don't, if you remember early on, I think I walked like four guys or yeah. guys on base every inning, and like I was, my stuff didn't look that sharp. I was kind of battling through the first like three to four innings, I'd say, yeah. and then it started to come around, you know, and I was throwing well, I was feeling good. Guys are making plays behind me. You know, yeah. the big thing about that game is, like, it wasn't just me. Like, our team was just playing great. We made all the yeah. plays. Um, you know, it was it was crazy. Yeah, it's funny because, and again, I was doing that game. I was just doing the print post. So, halfway through the game, I'm like, uh, I'm sort of in and out. I'm watching the game. I'm writing little notes down. And then I, I think it was, like, you know, like the sixth inning. They said, mm-hmm. oh, they're going to go back to you and just, you know, give your thoughts on, on packs and whatever. And I'm like, look, and I just had a quick look at you because I, I was paying attention. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I mean, I'm throwing myself under the bus here. And I'm like, uh, does that say zero hits? I'm like, no way. So then I started, you know, obviously the ears started perking up and watching. Yeah. When you, right before, like, when you got to a point late in that game, mm-hmm. did, the, did the pressure mount saying, don't screw this up? I've been waiting a long time to do this. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> the, to end the seventh inning, uh, I don't even remember that you probably do. Uh, Pilar hits a bullet down the third baseline, and Seeger dives, backhands it, throws it over to first. Mihili makes a pick. Seeger is running back to the dugout. Now he has to run past me to get to the dugout, and we're kind of end up. He runs right by me, and he says, yeah. "You're welcome." <laughs> yeah. Uh, at that point, I was like, "Oh man, I got to get this done." After he made that play, so he had two innings to go. And I was like, oh, man. Like, that was the first time I was like, oh, man, we really, I really got to do this now. Yeah. Um, and it was just, you know, full pedal on the gas pedal, doing, doing, doing everything I could to uh, try and get that done. <laughs> Going back, and this is something that you and I talked about before, before we, you came on. Spring training, first spring training, right? Mm-hmm. Tell me about the difference in emotion when you're throwing a hitter against the Blue Jays. To when you're trying to simulate a game against right. some poor dude. Who was the dude who – and you can tell the story, but who was the dude you yeah. drilled twice? Okay, so, <laughs> yeah. My first spring training, you know, I was nervous. First spring training, um, you, uh, I was throwing my first live BP. And this guy's name was Shaver Hansen. And he, uh, he's a switch hitter. Yeah. So, he's, you know, he's hitting against me in live BP, whatever. And – I'm out there. I'm trying to throw as hard as I can, trying to make an impression, you know, and I'm letting it rip. They're letting these guys know too. And I'm, when I'm coming inside, but I let go, he comes in, I think first time right-handed and I'm going in and I'm, and I'm going inside. They tell him I'm coming in and I, I let one go and I just, I pull it a little too far and I hit him right in the ribs and he like, you know, he buckles and he's like, Oh, I'm like, I felt so bad. I was like, Oh man, I'm sorry. Like I was, was he, was he like a, a, you know, rookie ball slash extended spring guy like you, or is he a little bit older? 
he was a little bit older. You know, yeah. he had been in spring training before. Like, right. it was probably his, like, third, maybe second or third spring training. You know, I'm a young guy. Like, just He's so like I- your rookie punk. Like, it could, yeah, cause exactly. there's a hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, he goes off this side, whatever. You know, I face a couple more guys. He comes back in left-handed. And What's I'm, he doing facing you left-handed? He's out of his mind. Anyway. Anyway, he comes in, you know, a few pitches in. We're going inside again. And I let it go, and I, it flies on me a little bit, and I hit him in the ribs on the other side. So here I am. I hit him on both sides in the ribs. And at this point, I've got to think, oh, this guy hates me. Like, I'm, he's never going to talk to me again. Um, ends up we play on the same team that year, and we ended up living together. Um, oh, no and, way. Yeah, luckily, he, he's a great guy, and we laughed about it and stuff. And, like, I clearly wasn't doing it on purpose. You know, you're not going to try to hit your own players in spring training. I was just – so nervous, so amped, trying to trying to make an impression and make a team. But was he was he facing you from the left side because he, he was in pain? He didn't want to expose those ribs. Is that I don't, right? <laughs> I don't know if he was trying to protect himself by facing me the other way, but it didn't work out for him because he got it on both sides. He'll never admit that, by the way. He'll be like, no. I don't know, I just want to come and get a couple of bats left. No, no, no. It's like, dude, they were throbbing back there. That's why. Exactly. What yeah. were we talking? What was this like? Mid nineties to the ribs? You think? I mean, I was, de- it was definitely probably in the 90s. Yeah, you know? either way, it stings, man. It completely yeah. stings, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. And <laughs> that's awesome. So, again, you know, it, you know, you're dealing with a back injury right now? Uh, yeah, I had surgery uh, February 5th uh, for – I had a cyst on my S1 nerve root. So, I was yeah. having some nerve pain going down my left leg. Um, luckily, that went really well. Um, the surgery went perfect. And I'm back to throwing bullpens and everything, feeling really good, no problems there. So, it's got some, all, some so. silver lining with this shutdown, dude. Because yeah, basically, I know. you know, I didn't get much of an off season because I spent so much time, yeah. you know, doing PT and stretching, trying to figure out what was going on with my back. And it so, took so, the whole off season to figure out that it actually was like a cyst in the so, in my back. So, what do you think it was before that? Because I've had chronic back issues. I've had spondylolisthesis in my spine. And it's just, mm-hmm. it's an ongoing, oh, your pelvis has to be like this. Your hip flexes, your blah, blah, blah. You, you get your core strong, all everything. So what, yeah. what, what, what kind of things did they diagnose it as before you figured out what it was? It was, uh, they didn't know, they didn't know exactly what was going on. They didn't know if like just yeah. some muscles were tight and they were causing things to be pinched in there or what. Um, but it took, uh, what was it? Like a myelogram and a CT that finally found this little, this little cyst. And I was talking to the doctor the guy has been doing this for 25 years. You know, he does yeah. all the, he does a lot of football players and stuff. Dr. Dawson down in uh, Dallas. And he told me he'd only seen this in seven people. In his really? years. Yeah, it's like super rare. Wow. Like, it just, like doesn't happen. But, uh, you know, it was just one of those things. He said he doesn't know how it happens. It just, it just happens randomly to very few people. Obviously, it's like a super rare thing. And he went in, took it out, and that was it. Were you scared at all? That before you, obviously, before you went under thinking, oh, man, don't mess with my spine here. If there's only seven people who had this, yeah. you're rolling in thinking, oh, man, this, this guy hasn't, you know, obviously he hasn't done too many of these. Was, was there any of that, like, you know, worried you, your arm slot's going to sneak back up and he like, <laughs> yeah. was going to come back or what? Like, was it, was it that, that element of, you know, what's going to happen when I come out of this or not? Uh, a little bit. I mean, it was just one of those things where, like, I was in such bad shape that, like, yeah. it was either I get this fixed or, you know, yeah. I'm not, I can't do this anymore kind of right. thing. I, I, wow. couldn't even put, I couldn't even tie my shoes, you know. What is that bad? Yeah, I couldn't bend over and tie my shoes. Were you trying mattresses and, and you know, all, all kind of gizmos to try and figure this thing out? Because I've uh, tried it all, man. I mean, I've tried yeah, it. you know, like I was doing stretches morning and night, you know, yeah. doing all kinds of things, trying to – and they would help a little bit, but it was just yeah. – it was terrible because um, it would grab me at times, like driving the car and stuff. Like and I just couldn't – I just couldn't sit down. Yeah, um, right. It was, uh, it was brutal. So it took me some time to uh, – yeah, so it's like I was just doing everything I could to yeah. try and get through, but it just it wasn't working. And uh, we found that uh, the the surgery was the only way to go. So I knew that I, I had to do this, or else I was going to be you know battling this forever. I just didn't want to do that. So and so now that you know, you're throwing bullpens, getting ready, are, are you you know do you keep track of your velocity and everything like mm-hmm. all those little things? Or are you just kind of um, I'm tracking my velocity a little bit right now. Um, we do put the gun on me. Um, 
it's hard. Like it's not going to be like game yeah. game level in a bullpen, yeah. you know, yeah, kind yeah. of thing. But yeah, I I think I've topped out in the bullpen throwing ninety four at this point. So I'm not I'm not worried about the yeah, yeah. the velo coming back. It's going to be there. Um, yeah. Right now I'm working on the the spin rate thing and right. working on that. It's I'm it's it is like I'm seeing some more life on the ball actually when I'm throwing with this uh, this new grip and everything. So it's right. it's cool to play with. Yeah, that's awesome. I just know, like, dealing with back issues, you know, in my career, all of a sudden come back, feel great. Velocity is just terrible because there's just no response. It's like, you know, right. nothing's, nothing's awake, you know. But yeah. anyway, Pax, this has been fun, dude. Um, yeah, look forward to seeing you when you roll through town and um, good to catch you during this uh, during this shutdown. Get, make sure you shave up that face. Oh, yeah, it'll be it'll be <laughs> nice and nice and baby face clean when by the time I go back and play. Yeah, I'm about to go shave right now for my <laughs> quarantine for the next two weeks. Well, nice. Wisconsin, are they are they pretty are they tight? What are their state rules right now? Are they starting to to take their foot uh, off a little bit. Yeah, we are. We have the stay at home going until I think it's uh, the 24th or 26th of this month, something gotcha. like that. Okay. Yep. That's yep. not too bad. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Same here, man. Here it's like. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, they got on it fast over there too. Yeah. They did a good job of getting people, you know, off the streets and in their homes pretty, uh, pretty quick over there. So I think yeah, you guys they, are doing pretty well, right? As far as the numbers. Doing, doing you know. well. I mean, I live, uh, I don't know if you ever spend any time at Green Lake, but you know, I, mm-hmm. I go run around Green Lake. There's just nothing but blue signs. Like basically you're the reason this park shut down because they, they, they you know, they close the parks on the weekends right. and then that you can only go single file, uh, one direction around the lake, you know, the whole yep. thing. I'm like, man, hey, look, you know, let, let us know about it if you get it. Exactly. <laughs> so, but, but they're coming out of it. But, but, but Pax has been fun, man. I, I appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you during the season. You bet. Thanks for having me. This was great. All right, awesome, man. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. All right. See you, Jamie. All right. Bye.